Welcome back to video 27.5. We will be discussing candidiasis, an immensely complex yeast. It doesn't fit neatly into the endemic or opportunistic fungal lectures, and so it's going to be discussed here by itself. Candidiasis infections may be divided into mucocutaneous versus deep invasive disease. Candida requires some defect in host immunity in order to cause infection, and in that sense it is opportunistic, but it does not require immunosuppression to cause disease. Candida is a small ovoid yeast that reproduces with budding. Candida may be visible on gram stain, and sometimes the yeast may resemble staph species. In the tissue, candida exists in three forms. The most common is as round blastospores. But in disease states, they may also exist as pseudohyphae or hyphae. The genus candida encompasses 150 species, but only a few cause disease. This list comprises the candida species that cause disease, but we will revisit this list as we go along, touching on the most important species as the lecture progresses. Previously, candida albicans was the causative organism in almost all cases of candidiasis. While albicans is still extremely important, non-albican species account for half the cases of candidemia. You will need to familiarize yourself with a few basic facts about the bolded non-albican species on this list. Some predisposing factors for infection are listed, the most important being recent antibiotic use, disruption or maceration of the skin or mucosa, indwelling catheters, or use of immunosuppressive agents. IV drug use and HIV infection are also important. Candida is easily cultured. In order to help us understand the pathogenesis of candidiasis, we're going to use the help of our celebrity New York friends. We'll call this guy Alec B. In New York City, there are lots of celebrities, like Mr. A.B. here. You may pass him on the street. And us non-celebrity New Yorkers, we love to pretend we don't even notice him. They don't bother us, and vice versa. Celebrities are part of the natural New York flora. But the moment the environment changes, the moment you start taking pictures or asking them for autographs, that's when pathology occurs. The celebrities can change from nice, benign, smiling celebrity New Yorkers to celebrities gone wild that will break your camera on the sidewalk. Candida is somewhat unique amongst the fungi in that candida are abundant commensals in healthy human microflora. Most candidiasis infections actually come from the patient's own flora rather than cross-infection from someone else. Because candida is in our native flora, candidiasis implies a change to either the organism, the host, or both. For sake of simplicity, first we'll talk about a change in the host. Either antibacterial agents alter the normal human bacterial flora, or there is a disruption of the skin or mucosa that exposes the candida to new binding sites in the extracellular matrix. Or a third possibility would be that an indwelling catheter or implanted medical device allows candida to proliferate and form a biofilm. In all three cases, there's some environmental change of the host that allows the fungi to proliferate. As proliferation occurs, there is an instrumental change in the fungi, which switch from their yeast to hyphal forms. Hyphal forms make strong attachments to human epithelial cells and secrete proteinases and phospholipases to facilitate further invasion of tissue. By this point, there will be a well-established local infection. From there, the hyphae may disseminate hematogenously and form micro or small macro abscesses in major organs. Notably, the pathogenesis of this model is incomplete, as Candida glabrata may cause disseminated disease, even though Candida glabrata is not capable of transforming into a hyphal form. Innate and mechanical immunity are the most important defense mechanisms against Candidiasis. PMNs provide a hardy first-line defense. The process is more efficient in the presence of an antibody or complement. A naturally occurring anti-man and IgG is one mechanism of activating the classical and alternate complement pathways. Unlike yeast, hyphae are too large to be ingested by PMNs, but PMNs can still kill hyphae with an oxidative burst. Cell-mediated immunity is also important. In a disease entity called chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, a T lymphocyte immunodeficiency results in chronic oral and vaginal candidiasis. 
There is a long list of mucocutaneous infection types, and we will only be briefly discussing a couple of these entities. When thinking about infections of the mucosa, in general, there is a superficial invasion of candida that produces a white, cheesy-looking plaque that is loosely adherent to the surface. Oral candidiasis, or thrush as it is commonly called, is mostly seen in individuals with severe debilitating illnesses, immunoincompetent patients, or inhaled steroid users. If thrush occurs in a healthy appearing person, it should prompt an immediate investigation for underlying HIV infection. In this picture, you see that thrush appears as discrete white patches on the buccal mucosa, tongue, and palate. When the white plaques are removed, for example with a tongue depressor, they reveal an inflamed or bleeding base. Oral candidiasis is often accompanied with esophageal involvement, which presents with odynophagia, reflux, or nausea. Intestinal involvement is also possible, with severe sequela including ulceration or perforation of the GI lumen. Vulvovaginal candidiasis is very common. It's accompanied with vulvar pruritus, pain, and a thin to curd-like whitish discharge. In this entity, antibiotics decrease lactobacilli in the vaginal flora, which normally inhibit candidal overgrowth. The entity balanitis is caused by candida in roughly one-third of cases. Patients present with burning or erythema, as well as white patches on the glands. Let's move on to cutaneous candidal infections. Paronychia is a painful swelling at the nail skin interface. Onychomycosis is a nail infection. In onychomycosis, there is associated nail thickening, whitish discoloration, and nail loss. Both of these conditions occur more in individuals that immerse their hands for long periods of time in water. Intertrigo is an erythematous irritation in the skin folds. This pruritic eruption appears as erythematous macerated patches with satellite fasciculopustules that themselves eventually rupture and macerate. Candidal diaper dermatitis arises from chronic wet diapers breaking down the skin of the genital area. It's also hypothesized that in these patients, yeast colonize the GI tract, also contributing to pathogenesis. The cutaneous manifestations of a hematogenous disseminated candidiasis are painful macronodular lesions. They indicate a high probability of dissemination and seeding to other organs. Invasive candidiasis presents with a septic-like picture. Most commonly, Invasive candidiasis is the result of hematogenous seeding. Once candida gains access to the intravascular compartment, it spreads to a variety of organs. Nearly any organ can be involved with disseminated candidiasis. If chorioretinal involvement is noted, it is highly indicative of widespread disease. Conversely, if systemic disease has been diagnosed, endophthalmitis should always be investigated, even if there are no visual symptoms, since this ocular involvement requires special treatment to prevent blindness. The three most common mechanisms of invasive candidiasis from non-hematogenous spread is contiguous spread through the skin, a catheter-initiated infection, or spread from a perforation or erosion in the GI tract. The diagnosis of candida is established by direct visualization of hyphae. Identification of yeast forms is less helpful since yeast exists in the normal flora. Candida is readily cultured, but ironically this brings up a diagnostic challenge. One must determine whether the bloodstream isolates are from local colonizations or inconsequential seeding of the bloodstream from a catheter versus a true hematogenous dissemination. Recovery of candida from the sputum is virtually never indicative of underlying pulmonary candidiasis, as candida is very common in the pharynx. Candida in the urine may represent benign bladder colonization rather than a true urinary tract infection. Other considerations to make when interpreting positive cultures is how sick is the patient? Are there other possible etiologies for the illness? How much other data do we have to support a diagnosis of candidiasis? One other test worth mentioning is a serum beta-D-glucan test, commonly used to aid diagnosis, but its reliability is not firmly established. Positive tests are not specific for candida, as many fungi have glucan in their cell wall. The negative predictive value, however, does have utility. 
Cutaneous infections are treated with a topical azole. Oral thrush is treated with nystatin, which is a low-dose polyene that is swished and gargled in the mouth and eventually swallowed. Esophageal or other GI involvement, however, requires systemic treatment, usually with orofluconazole. Vulvovaginitis is treated with either orofluconazole or with vaginal suppository. Hematogenous candidiasis is slightly more complicated to treat. Most sources say that all patients with positive cultures should be treated with a systemic agent. Polyenes, echinocandins, and azoles are all used in treating systemic disease, and no class has been clearly identified as superior to others. Fluconazole is the most common empiric agent of choice, but special attention must be paid to fungal culture sensitivities. There are some special treatment considerations beyond this. Candida glabrata and Candida cruzii are often resistant to fluconazole or may have dose-dependent resistance. Conversely, Candida parapsilosis is less sensitive to echinocandins. Candida lusitaniae is resistant to anthotericin B. Candida tropicalis is a more virulent non-albican species. Despite the fact that fluconazole is the most common empiric agent used in unstable or neutropenic patients, broader fungal coverage is often desirable. Here's a review of those non-albican species. Many centers administer fluconazole to transplant patients as candidal prophylaxis. Prophylaxis of neutropenic patients also varies from center to center, but a New England Journal of Medicine trial from 2007 suggests if you are going to prophylax neutropenic patients, posiconazole might be the preferred agent. So that's it for Candida. Happy studying, and be careful not to look those New York celebrities in the eye. See you soon.